Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure and an honor. Um, I'll start by saying congratulations. This is the hard part, showing up. And I know I'm following a tremendous lineup of speakers and there are more to come, but I'm thrilled to have you here. I've uh, had the pleasure of doing these a number of times over the last few years. And I'm coming off the backs of our most recent WNBA season, which finished for us about um, two-ish weeks ago. And when I was asked to do it, I was still in what I like to affectionately call the morning period post season where I just need some time to thaw out. And so with that in mind, I wanted to take a different approach an interactive approach. I want to be vulnerable with you and I'm gonna ask you to do the same. And so what I wanna do is start with an activity, okay? And it's an interactive activity. Um, my philosophy is that learning at its best is both participatory and it's active. And so if you're here, I'm gonna assume, I'm gonna read into it, I'm gonna push you to be a participant, be active and engaged and contribute because I need your help. But before we get there, let's start with an activity that uh, I picked up from a guy named Steve Shenbaum and it's called coins. And essentially it seeks to answer the question, tell me about yourself. And so a coin or this activity called coins um, plays on this analogy that coins are things that you value and they help define you, your values. They could be hobbies, activities, interests, achievements, uh, positive experiences. It's your choice. But for the sake of our time, let's not have it be a coin being, say, being a basketball coach. Let's go a little deeper, uh, be a little more vulnerable. It can be anything that has meaning to you, big or small. Let me go first. Here are some of my coins. The lady and the baby. That's my better half and my not so baby little guy, but it's what uh, I've affectionately referred to them um, as um, forever. And they are my whys. So they're my coins. I carry them with me in my pocket wherever I go. Another coin for me is traveling. Um, I just love to travel. We travel for food, we travel to learn, but it is a core part of my identity, seeing the world, experiencing new cultures, new people, reading, um, better said, learning is something that um, is, is not just something I seek out, it's something that fuels me and is energizing. It's an important part of my makeup. Gardening, which is um, a post-pandemic positive byproduct where I've fallen in love with getting my hands rooted in the soil and it's my getaway. It is just fueling in so many different ways. And last and certainly not least, gratitude. It is, it seems ambiguous and it might be for other people, but it is uh, something I do with intention. Uh, it is what grounds me. It is what uh, is a de-stressor. It is something that I anchor around. And so these are my coins. And so I'm gonna turn back to each of you. I'll give you 45 seconds. And what I like you to do in the chat um, is to type in, don't click uh, enter or return just yet, but type in as many different coins as you can. All right, your time starts now. Awesome, I love it. I love it. Beautiful. So. Everybody's enlisted because we're going to get our hands dirty. And this, this, this coin activity is important because before we can jump in and before we can embark on any endeavor, we gotta, we gotta learn more about one another. We gotta get to know each other more than just what we do, a little bit more about who the person is, whether it be me or you or, or an athlete we're working with. So, we wanna do some workshopping, as I like to call it. I want each of you to imagine for a moment that you've been invited into a pro team, whether it be WNBA, NBA, or overseas in Europe. And you are the director of player development, why not? 
and you've been tasked with coming up with an assessment and an approach for development for an athlete. Okay. And I'm going to show you video of this athlete, a little background on this athlete. This athlete is an eight year WNBA veteran, um, was once uh, most improved, was all defense in the league, uh, multiple time all-star, um, played high level D1, was I think the fourth pick overall in their draft year, and uh, most recently played um, at a top level European club um, when they weren't in their WNBA season. So here it is. Here's your athlete. And here's what we're looking or what you've been tasked with improving. I'll let it loop a few times. So what would be your assessment and how would you go about correcting this? Let me show it to you from another angle. So we have a veteran player who has struggled with consistency with their free throw shooting. And it's become a limiting factor, All right? You think late game, big game, situation where fouls, people are gonna be fouled and you're getting yanked. So this is, this is what would be for me a characterized little limiting factor for this athlete to be able to play. All right, you've seen it from multiple angles. What's your assessment and how would you address? This is where you get to be um, lean and lucid. <laughs> so I want each of you to uh, take a, a moment if you're willing to be vulnerable with me and jump back into the chat. And be lean with your words. You don't, don't need a, a long one, but what's your assessment? What would you fix first? Is it one or two or three things? Just give us a two or three word for each on what you would fix first. What would you address first? I'll give everybody a minute. And what I'll do is I'll go back and let you watch it a few more times from the side and then I'll do the back. I'll give you a countdown. So you're on team player development. All right, 30 more seconds. I'm gonna give you another view from the front. If some of you out there are like me, multiple angles help. Fifteen more seconds. Talk about being under pressure. All right, right about now, you should be typing up, being lean and lucid, lean in terms of brevity, lucid in terms of clarity, because Danielle, I'm gonna to turn to you as well to choose a couple. And uh, I, I wanna hear what people think, what their approach would be. All right, click enter if you haven't already. Okay, we've got kitchen shooting, shot rhythm by rebuilding it with her. Kinetic chain is broken. I'd explain it to her and get buy-in for change. Get her to shoot as she's rising off a chain and use a Q word. Break down the shot into individual phases, then work on tying them together. The shot is now disjointed. Need buy-in from the player first. Beautiful. Garden hose theory. I have no idea what that is, Anthony. <laughs> you going? You might be going deep on me. Anthony, if you want to ex expand on that, you can. 
I'm so curious to know what the guard hose theory is. I've never heard about this. Awesome. Okay. Well, I appreciate your participation. This was, um, this was and is a, a very real scenario. This was the scenario that we were faced with this past year. Um, and almost like you being put on the spot, um, you know, I felt like I was put on the spot too in that um, our facility with the Washington Mystics is shared with the Wizards. And so there were a lot of eyes watching the process. And so it definitely was the most interesting riddle that I've, I've been faced with in all my years. And um, it, it, it's exciting. So I, I share some of the ideas and let me share with you the approach that um, we took. Let me show you a snapshot first. And I'll, I'll show you the progress and then I'll come back at the end and uh, I'll share with you some of the, the process behind it. So that first, um, those first clips were first touch in May when this athlete joined the team. And this is a look in June. The, the hitch is still present but not as in my assessment. All right, let's take a, take a look at July. The hitch to my eye is less pronounced. We were moving when we talked cueing, we were moving to what we were referring to as more of a one motion shot. And then this is where we arrived in August. This would be the last snapshot. Progress, yes. Perfect, no. Let me share our process. So for starters for me, you know, I have this grounding belief and, and a few others touched on it, that for learning to take place, one, the learner has to be interested. And two, it needs to be something that they can learn, right? Sometimes we get caught up asking an athlete to do something that's just not in their capacity, capability. It could be um, because of how their body moves, uh, it could be because of restriction, injury, whatever it may be, um, dysfunction. And so those two things need to be present, uh, in my opinion, as you're working with somebody. The last piece that I haven't included in there, and it was touched on by others, was this idea of being motivated, motivated and capable. So the approach that we took was we started small. And the key thing is, was around building trust. I, I don't think you can make progress with an athlete if they don't trust you. And oftentimes we assume that trust is built in or it's uh, ascribed by just sure, hey, I'm the head coach, you need to trust me, I'm gonna do. And there are times in um, at various levels of play where you can get away with that. Um, when you're working with professional athletes, that's not the case in my experience. Um, sometimes they couldn't care less if you're the head coach, the player development guy. They want to know if they can trust you. And so that's where we started. The other thing I did was I abandoned any preconceived notions or solutions. You know, things that had worked for me in the past, uh, as the years have gone on, I've decided just to stay present, deal with the athlete in front of me, learn them up, how they move. I think everybody's got a, uh, a movement profile is the way I describe it. And, and not try and make them into something that I want them to be or what I think they should be. Instead, as a former mentor of mine, Dr. Yolanda Brooks would say to me is, 
teach them where they're at. And so many years ago, I started uh, to understand that I needed to stop believing that my shit, forgive my language, my stuff smelled good. And I needed to trust the athlete. I need to listen to the athlete. I couldn't just come with this prescriptive approach. And so I abandoned all preconceived notions because frankly, going back to the first one, starting small, everything that I thought would work didn't work within the first week of working with this athlete. And so I needed to back up and zoom out. My approach was then to educate, enroll, and onboard. And as somebody else had mentioned, you know, I think understanding that this is something that we are doing together was a key and necessary step that we had to make. This is a really um, switched on, beautifully brilliant athlete, alert, has worked with far better. Uh, minds than we're in the gym with her, including myself. Um, she's had numerous touch points over the course of, uh, you know, let's say 15 years, eight years in the pros, four years in college, and some really top notch people, and it hadn't been solved. And so I just acknowledged it with her. I said, I, I don't know if I can fix this, um, but I sure am going to try. And I'll talk you through the whys behind what we do and We'll work through it. If you don't want to do it, that's okay. <laughs> you know. And so we started to educate. And then that was part of my onboarding. One of the hard problems on a player development standpoint, um, definitely in the WNBA, the W to me is unique in this regard, but I think it shows up in different contexts too, is it's, it's hard to be in both performance and development at the same time. And so when you're, when you're working with athletes, you have to understand how you are either setting them up to be in development or setting them up to be in performance through your, your practice design, your time of year. There are all these factors. And so for us in the W, you know, our athletes are with us for five, six months, and then they spend another six to seven uh, overseas in another context. They are always in performance. And what I mean by that is there's the outcome is always important for them. There really is no off season. You think of, you know, the WNBA finals are still going on right now. There's numerous athletes in the finals who are going to hop on a plane, potentially as early as tomorrow, fly literally halfway around the world to Australia to play in a basketball world cup. We're going to compete for a, a championship or a medal at the world cup and then are going to turn around and hop on another plane and go to their respective teams internationally. They'll finish that season and they'll be right back with us in the W. So there really isn't a development period, an obvious uh, development period. And so you have to find uh, the buy-in with them. You know, for those of you who are coaching high school or collegiately, your off seasons or your gaps are clear. But sometimes you have to be able to develop during the performance standpoint. And in my opinion, to do that, you've got to get buy-in. I flipped the cues. And I realized that all internal cues, hand position, uh, segmenting the shot, none of those things worked. In fact, my assessment as I was working with her was, a lot of that was part of the problem and, and I'm not making an indictment of, of anybody. This is a, a really switched on um, uh, player. Uh, she, she, she understands she's heard it all. And I equate what was happening a lot to if anybody's seen Charles Barkley's swing, I think they call it the yips because as soon as I flipped the cues from internal to external, and then I used constraints to trick the brain the difference was demonstrable and wasn't really had anything to do with what I had done in terms of my coaching, but it, when the task changed, the brain overruled everything else. I'll give you an example. Look at this. So this is May of this summer. This is within, I think our first or second session, same athlete. Look how fluid and how smooth this looks. It's coordinated. It's leveraging her up force, force generation. And it comes off the hands. I got that whip it action, which I like to see. The only difference here 
is I asked her to shoot from the baseline behind the backboard and she had to shoot over the backboard. So I used the constraint of the backboard to see if I could unlock and force the brain to coordinate force generation. And so that was my first curiosity. I'm like, oh, wait a second, it's in her. Similarly, we would move out to the three-point line. And this is somebody who, I don't think she's shot any threes in her, her, in her career. Um, but you get her out to the three-point line, the same thing, you have this coordinated, smooth, fluid shot. And so I quickly really realized that the issue wasn't as much functional in terms of her movement, but there was something that was there that I couldn't access between the ears. And so then at that point, I abandoned all block practice because the thing that um, we, we noted as we were working together, she can shoot that same. So we were able to take that constraint driven shot that you saw last and we moved it to different locations and she was able to replicate it. But then as soon as we said shoot a free throw, I called it a hiccup. We affectionately referred to it as a hiccup. The hiccup appeared again. If I took her off the free throw line and we we call it, we called it pep, we were peppering around just fun names I put to things, but we were working for more um, varied spots um, and then would randomly bring her back, she could replicate. But as soon as she got attuned, if I said, hey, free throws, the hiccup would would appear again. So fascinating movement riddle. And so this was was the approach that we adopted. All right, I appreciate everybody um, jumping in on that task. I'm gonna come back to you and let you know how things ended in a moment, but I just wanted to take a quick time out before we dive into this next segment, which I'm gonna jump through and there will be some engagement as well. And then I wanna conclude with some lessons I've learned in the wake of our season. How many squares? I'm gonna give, some of you I might have actually done this with me before, but uh, if, you, if you haven't, how many squares do you see in this image? You've got 24 seconds. Again, uh, without hitting enter, type your answer into the chat. And on my go, we'll, uh, Danielle, I'll get you to fire through and read back some of these answers. I'm curious to see who can get this right. You've got 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Go, hit enter. Let's see what you got. 22, 17, uh, Danielle, I'm seeing some of these, 30, 25. Yeah, we've got 24, 23, 27, 26, 22. <clears throat> A lot of variety. Okay, cool. Let's take a look at the answer. You have 16 one by ones, nine two by two. So anybody who is less than 25 is out. Here are your nine two by twos, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are four three by threes. And there's one four by four. The correct answer is 30. Do we have anybody? Hugo, well done. <laughs> The correct answer is 30. Awesome. Most of us act on less than 30 squares in terms of when we're looking at an athlete and we're assessing information, we're looking at those 30 things. And I love this analogy because um, I used to talk about trying to get to a 30 square performance. You know, maybe an athlete comes to you at 10, 15 squares and well, how do you you build the, the competency and the capacity to grow into 30 squares. And as I've played with this analogy more, and it, it draws back to this athlete that um, I shared with you, I realized that we're not seeing the whole picture. Athletes aren't one dimensional. Human beings aren't one dimensional. So it's in fact, it's more than the 30 square performance. They're three dimensional. If not, I'm sure, um, uh, you know, the, the philosophers in there uh, might even take it deeper and say that as human beings, we're more than 
three-dimensional or multi-dimensional. I don't know. But I know that if we're only existing and relating to one part, one face of a multi-faceted um, person, then we're, we're not dealing with the whole. There are co-actives. And I do still um, anchor what I do in player development around the mental, the physical, the technical, and the social, emotional, those four things. But more and more, I've tried to push myself to treat them as what I call co-actives, right? These things are, there's an interleaving, there's an intertwine between. So instead of isolating and segmenting and blocking, chunking things out, I try and address all of these things cooperative, cooperatively. And similarly, like athletes, they, there's different shapes and angles and depths. And this is what I was kind of referring to with this athlete is that she, she, she missed and her issue wasn't left right, which is usually, which is for me, I should say a red flag. She always missed short, long, and she did have an issue with arc. But we could correct those and you could see her hold on to that in our training sessions. And, and it was evidenced by um, in a rose. In fact, I think her, her PB was um, 20, I want to say 25, 26 in a rose shots that were at the, the depth of entry that we wanted. So we've got a NOAA shooting system, fortunately. But for those of you who've heard me talk about Brad's, uh, it's the same idea. But her, we, we decided that her optimal angle of entry was uh, a 46, 47. And so to get 26 or 25 shots in a row that were Brad shots that were entering in at an angle of 45, 46 was incredible. And she could repeat this in that last month of training. She could repeat that with consistency going five in a row, might miss one, go eight in a row, might miss two, then drop a 11 in a row. So we had consistency of it. I'm going to give you a quick reflective task. When you think about your team, what would you drop into this? If my team can blank, blank and blank, what other things would easily fall in place? Now, I'm not asking you to answer this for the group. We've done a number of interactive and I appreciate everybody jumping all in, but I think it's an important one to ask of yourself. And it's one that, you know, our associate head coach, Eric Tebow asks of us all the time. And, and he always thinks this way, you know, if we can handle switches, double teams and hard hedges, we'll be fine. You know, would be some of the key things that we boil it down to from a player development standpoint. What would those things be? And then to push yourself to go deeper and boil things down simply and consistently over time. And this is where my approaches have changed uh, when tackling um, the, the riddle, the puzzle that was presented in this athlete. You know, I've zoomed out. I'm less internal technical. It's more principle-based, force generation. How is she generating force with her body and how is that force being translated into the implement? In our case in basketball, that's the ball. With different athletes, I might come to different conclusions, but I'm zooming out. And so for me, from a player de development standpoint, I might say, if a player can generate force simply, repeatedly, and consistently, and can transfer that force into the ball, and the ball can enter the hoop, consistently and repeatedly in the same way, then we're all right. And then that answers a lot of questions, whether I need to make adjustments, technical adjustments, positional adjustments. If they can do those things, then I don't touch it, all right? And so this is where I got to, and I, I wanna leave this one with you so you can answer these questions for yourselves. You may come to different conclusions. I wanna share nine lessons. I've learned in player development. A lot of these are hot topics coming off the wake of uh, this past season. Um, I shared that I do my own little mini post-mortem as a team. We do a lot of postseason discussions to kind of 
get naked and be vulnerable and talk about where we fell short and where we could have been better. Um, we do the same uh, activity with our players. And here are some of my takeaways. And I'll, I'll share these nine and then I'll open it up for some questions. First one, first the person and then the player. And I know several of you touched on it before. This as well speaks to that analogy of the Rubik's cube, right? There's a person behind the player. You can't separate them out. I've given up and have long since um, accepted that I need to work with the person. This relates to buy-in. This relates into connection. This relates to permission. And so it's not enough to coach the plan. You have to coach the person in front of you. How is it that the body, the brain, and the emotions at different ages and stages come together? I like to call it coaching the whole, not just the parts. Mike McKay, who um, shared this with me, and I think he shared it with many others. In fact, I know he has. Uh, but this one rang true for me when I heard it um, so many years ago, 10 years ago, and I wrote it down and it's become an anchoring um, paradigm for me. Your who plus your why gives you your what and your how. And so I used to start with my what and my how. These um, you know, conclusions I've drawn about how to solve all these solutions for players, whether it be movement or technical, tactical solutions. And now I flipped it. And I understand, well, who's, who's the person in front of me? What are their motivations? Why are they here? What do they want to get out of this? Do I have buy-in? Do I have permission? All right, what are influencing them? And then that determines my what and my how. I think tied to this is making sure that whomever has a touch point on an athlete is giving feedback and communication that is both aligned and complementary. We don't necessarily need to use the same words, but the message should be consistent and complementary. And this was a lesson I learned a number of years ago is that alignment is more important than agreement. And it's one of the things that I enjoy most about uh, this coaching team that I'm a part of is uh, um, if you ever sat in a room with us, we argue, um, <laughs> we argue, period. Uh, there's trust, there's, but we just get in and it's a bear all. There's no, um, no hidden agendas. And if, you know, our, our head coach, Mike Tebow, if he hears something he doesn't like, you know, infamously, he might say, I'm going to call bullshit on that. And he'll demand that you go deeper. And we don't always agree but the intent and the impact of going through the process is that we leave aligned. And that's the most important thing when you're looking at player development um, and the messaging a player gets when you're talking about your strategy, your tactic, your culture, whatever it may be. Alignment is the most important thing rather than agreement. A lot of times people think you need to agree and that's not the case. In fact, I would argue um, having been around a lot of different environments, performance environments, both in sport and in business, that most are not in agreement. In fact, you probably don't want to be in agreement because if everybody's in agreement all the time, that means nobody's thinking outside the box. But you can, with respect, leave being aligned. Second one, I, 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 I steal this from my good friend, Manawatsa, is being able to connect before you correct. This goes back to what I shared earlier about getting permission. I know in pro sports, it's, it seems odd. And in fact, I would argue at lower levels, it seems odd to ask somebody for permission to say, hey, are you willing to go there with me? And being okay with a, a no or a not right now. But to correct without having connected, you'll never go as far as fast as you need to and so this step is critical and does not, in my opinion, get talked about enough when we're talking about player development or team development. The third one, the primary function of a coach is to direct attention. I'm of the belief that the first barrier to learning 
is attention. So our words matter. Our body language matters. Our daily training environment matters to help players pay attention to the appropriate information in the right time and in the right way. You know, so you got to think about, you know, how are you directing their attention, uh, whether it be implicitly through tasks, games, uh, environmental uh, cl clues and cues, you know, games-based activities, direct attention in a certain way, uh, a drill-based uh, approach, uh, direct approach will direct attention in another way. What is it you're trying to get out of the learning environment? And think about how it how it creates affordances or constraints around attention. How does it direct an athlete's attention? Ooh, we double down on that slide. I'll skip that. And so here's, here's my, my thinking. I spent a lot of time focused on how, to, how the process, designing the process, and then setting an intention. And I do use these words with athletes. <laughs> You know, hey, this is where I want you to place your attention. Our intention of, around this activity is dot, dot, dot. And then to guide the emotion, right? When I referred to the athlete that we workshopped earlier, I realized over time that there was a certain emotion that she was experiencing when she stepped to the free throw line. Now, in the early goings, I didn't have access to that space Right. She's um, she's not a player of many words. She's very cerebral and had countless people telling her how to, to fix this. And so she said little, but I could observe that something was different when we went to shoot free throws. And so, you know, she and I sat and we talked and I did a bear all, you know, um, but it was really guiding the emotion to the point that my cues changed. So when I talked about um, varied movements and some random things, I started to refer to the foul line as home. I wanted a different emotion when she stepped to that, to that free throw line because there, I knew there was something that I wasn't able to access. So I'd say, hey, let's do, you know, we're going to do these shots and they might be varied. And then when you're ready, work your way home. And I wanted to connect that emotion of being home, a place of comfort, this idea that, hey, when I go there, I want to foul and finish. And I'm going to make my three-point play because I'm home. I'm relaxed. I'm composed. And so when we talk about player development, people talk about the moves and everything, but people don't talk about the intent, the perception, the emotion, right? We get caught on cueing the action. And so I just want to challenge the, the thinking around it. Design the process, set the intention, guide the emotion, cue the action, direct the attention, rinse, repeat. Fourth one, feedback should be fast, focused, and actionable. I, I love this, and it connects to the last. Uh, Bryce Tully, who is a, a brilliant uh, sports psychologist who had been with Canada, ball, Canada basketball for a number of years, said something that I wrote down. He said, feedback drives attention. All right, so you wanna evaluate the quality of your feedback. Like I said earlier, is it lean, is it lucid, All right? Is it descriptive? What has happened? Is it predictive? What will happen? Is it prescriptive? What to do next? So like that actionable feedback. And then is your feedback aligned and complimentary. Maybe an athlete comes through on run repetition and you give them feedback on one, two, and three. And then they leave and they come through and then all of a sudden you see something else and then you're giving them feedback on four, five, and six or somebody else is. Your feedback, right? We talked about directing attention. If it's not com complimentary and consistent, the athlete um, directly or indirectly learns that the thing you're giving feedback on isn't that important to you if the feedback continues to change? And this is a, to me is particularly important when we're talking about performance versus development. It's easy to be consistent with our feedback in development, but can we also carry the feedback from the development or from a practice phase into the game? Are the things that you're wanting them to do consistently and repeatedly 
is that showing up in your language across your coaching staff or your team? Fifth thing, change where you stand and you'll change what you see. And this is the thing that uh, over the years I've tried to do a better job of is changing my perspective and understanding that one angle is not enough. So where you stand will impact what you see, just like that analogy of the Rubik's cube, right? If I only stand in the front, I only see those 30 squares. I only see that one side of things. And sometimes physically it means changing your location. Remember Italian coach Mario De Sisti would say, hey, if you're watching offense, you should be on the baseline. I wanna see their eyes. I wanna see what they're perceiving. If I'm watching defense, I would stand at half court again. I wanna see their eyes. I wanna see their position. I wanna see what they're perceiving. So sometimes it is literal. Where you stand impacts what you see. Other times it's more figurative. Asking an athlete, what are they seeing, feeling, thinking? Asking an outside voice or another coach to look at the same thing and see if you're, if you're picking up the same cues. Sometimes we can be a bottleneck to players learning when we stop learning. Quick visual, you know, we talked about everything you know, you know, and on one side is the good stuff that's moving you forward, but equally and probably more impactful is the things that are not so that you believe to be so, the things that are not true and that are pulling you back. You know, as a coaching community, and I think it's especially true in basketball and probably the four majors, I, I think we are less adaptive um, than some of the marginalized sports, uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, we have a tendency to hold on to things that I put in the category of it's always been that way or coaching the way we were coached or played or parented. And these are the things that we need to fight and resist. You know, we get in this cycle of repeating, regurgitating, you know, feeling like, yeah, our stuff smells good versus anchoring on this idea of possibility. You know, I said something this year to a player that somebody kind of was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you said it. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I said, I don't know. And, you know, especially at the highest levels, I, I see people all the time and I laugh uh, inside, whereas this feeling like I need to have the answers. And if there's one thing I've taken away and I've accepted about myself, which I think has allowed me to connect better is to be able to like, I don't know. And the thing that allows connection because I don't stop there is I don't know, but we can figure it out together. And I mean that that's sourced from a really genuine place, but that is how I think, believe and operate that connection before correction. And I don't have all the answers. I'm of the core belief that if you signed up to coach, you signed up to learn, paid or unpaid. And I think we need to resist and fight this, this notion in our coaches community that somebody says, hey, I'm just a volunteer. I'm like, whoa, you're doing the most important job that there is. You, you, you have an impact in far more ways than a, a teacher and sometimes a parent or a friend can have. And so we have to continue to challenge thought, challenge convention and go deeper with what, why, and how we do things. Sixth one, I think uh, I felt it pre-pandemic, but after having gone through the pandemic and have talked to numerous coaches at numerous levels, it was an important reminder that we've got to put our face masks on first. And you know, think of those of you who have flown, you got that message that says, place the oxygen mask on yourself before helping small children or others who may need assistance. And this is especially true for us as coaches. I love this cartoon because this is, reminds me of, I think this is a, a universal truism for people who have committed to the, the task of coaching is that we have all these things that we're managing, whether it be family, life, work, and the task of coaching and dealing with all the behavioral and tactical, strategic scouting, all that comes with it. You know, it's almost like we're burning it at three ends, but we've got to be able to step back and understand, not just 
so that we can be present. But I feel like a lot of times when we talk about emotion, our emotion as coaches impacts the emotions of our players. But as coaches, oftentimes from a development standpoint or from, from a coaching standpoint, we don't have an attunement to the energy we're bringing to an environment and how it impacts the kids. Maybe we've been teaching and we come out of class and we're frustrated or we've had a breakdown with a boss or an employee and we show up with this tension or in a game where, where you know, we say it all the time in the W, you know, uh, well, actually, let me take that back because I could get fined. Um, often as coaches, we talk about the officials <laughs> and, um, you know, we get caught up in this, this game with the officials and all of a sudden we're angry. We're red zoning because of the, the call that wasn't made or should have been made. And we then turn back and we just point all of that aggression on our players. And so we need to think about that. You don't have different coaching styles. You have people coaching who have different ways of handling and expressing performance stress. When we talk about development of our players, when we talk about development of ourselves, I think the one thing that's missing in the conversation around coach development is understanding how performance stress impacts us and then how do we how do we deal? How do we cope? How do we adapt to that so we're not putting that performance stress back on our players? Number seven is my twist on a truism or something I stole from the All Blacks. Uh, better people, better people. It's, it's been a lesson that I've learned. Um, I think it applies to whomever you decide to be a, a part of your coaching team. I think it applies to whether you're in our context where you're drafting and scouting or whether you're at a collegiate and you're recruiting or whether you're in a program that players are being fed to you. You know, character development is a key part of player development. It's probably one of the least talked about or least taught things and yet one of the most important things. The, the character of an individual is the Achilles heel that will impact whether they can actually become what they could become. And so we need to, with intention, draft for character, uh, recruit for character, and develop character. That needs to be a core component of our practice plan. Number eight, I wanna encourage you all to have an acute awareness of what I call the silent drivers of team culture and learning. I'll give you all three. First one, shot selection. Second one, ball movement. And the third one, practice design. I'll talk about them quickly, but I'm gonna let you sit with them. Um, shot selection can be it, it doesn't matter what you say about your team's culture and all the activity you do. If you are, don't have clarity, you don't create clarity amongst your team of what a good shot looks like, you know, what that yeah shot looks like, and you allow players to take off balance contested shots that aren't late clock, this thing will be corrosive and will undermine all the other things that you're doing. Second one, ball movement. This is one that I got hot to this season in our post-mortem. Um, post-mortem with myself, and then in turn, I shared it with our coaching team. Is I used to talk about the extra pass, or what we used to call penetration pass-pass, that one more as being more of a style of play, tactical thing. And one of the things that was like a kidney punch to me this year, as I observed our team and other teams, I realized that it's more than that. It impacts how players think and feel, emote, and how they commit to your team if that ball doesn't move. So if you, don't want, if you want a team where the ball doesn't move, then do so with an intention and communicate that that's a part of what you do. But if you haven't thought about how ball movement impacts team culture, I'm inviting you to do so because it can definitely be one of those things that undermines all the other things. And last one, I won't go deep on this, 
Um, I heard, you know, Sergio was on earlier and I've, I've talked about it in other ones and I'm happy to come back to it. But I think practice design has a significant impact on team culture and more importantly, the learning of the players within your environment. Number nine, our last one. Learning has only happened when the thing you're working on shows up in the game. It seems obvious, and yet I think it gets forgotten. And so to, to go full circle on our workshop, our case study that we had earlier, we were able to, and so we moved through all the different phases of teaching you know, Canada, phase A, phase B, phase C, phase D, which is, you know, phase A would be on air, repetition, blocked. You know, you can add variable random in, into phase A to phase B with a guide. Maybe you're adding distraction, noise. Even as a free throw, you can get into phase B. Phase C, now you're getting into more game-like things, one-on-ones, two-on-twos, three-on-threes. And then phase D is what looks the most like the game, five-on-five. And so one of my anchoring beliefs is that if I'm working on something from a player development standpoint, but that thing doesn't show up in the game, then it hasn't been learned. And so with this athlete, although it was positive and encouraging that we were able to replicate with consistency with the process outcomes that we were looking for, the learning hadn't took place. And we talked about it because the thing that we were working on didn't and wasn't being replicated in the game. Now we had a low sample size, didn't get fouled a lot, didn't have many instances. In fact, we were just, you know, we made light of it. We were trying to, she was trying to seek fouls and end ones and she's got great hands and can finish. And, and we wanted a bigger sample size to some games she might be two for two and then other games she might be one for two. So we needed a larger sample size, but the agreement was that we're still on that journey. Um, so I haven't quote, won the battle or solved the puzzle or the riddle because we need a larger sample size because we did see this kind of regression. You know, we'd have success, so to speak, on one day, and then we were kind of going back down the mountain on the second day. Now, we could prime and get her back quickly, but it wasn't retained, and then it didn't transfer to the game. And so that, for me, is the ultimate uh, feedback. Uh, for me as a player development person is, is the thing that we're working on showing up in the game. All right. I was late and I apologize for that. We had some technical issues. I'm going to call a timeout. Danielle, I'll turn it back. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. Um, if we don't, I'm happy to uh, communicate with people offline, but uh, you let me know what's doable on your end. Yeah, we definitely have time for questions. So I'm just going to give people a minute if they do have any to drop them either in the question box. Oh, I see one here. You said you determined this specific player's optimal entry angle was 45 to 46. To you, the optimal entry angle isn't the same for every player. If it differs, how would you identify the angle? Oh, this is a good question. So I don't, I don't really hold on to absolutes. Um, so the idea of the optimal entry angle, which was um, some of you may have heard me talk about Brad's back rim and down. Um, this term was coined by NOAA, NOAA basketball. They have the analytics system and they've tracked and actually their data has been um, cross-referenced or validated by a number of universities as well. Um, and they determined the optimal angle of entry to be 45 degrees. But it does vary, right? It varies based on proximity to the basket. And so if we eliminate for anything under 10 feet, because those tend to be higher arcing shots uh, over 45 degrees, it does also vary for the height of the angle, the length of their levers, the angle of deployment, all of these things affect it. And so I whittle it down to simple, repeatable, and effective. At some point, when an athlete shoots too high of an arc, they lose control. And so you see an inconsistency. So that's the first indicator that their arc is too high. 
I have not met an athlete who at 45 degrees, it's too high. But I have seen athletes, they get to 48, 49, 50, and it's too high, they lose control. For this athlete, we actually netted, um, I, I cheated the system a little bit in that um, when I encouraged her to shoot at 45, when we kind of started from 45, she would shoot at 42, 43. And so we actually, maybe I might've said it incorrectly, we, we decided 46, 47 was her sweet spot because 45, if she had a target of 45, she would shoot under 45. But if we anchored on 46, she could hold 46, 47. And by looking at the, the data, the analytics, she was more consistent with those shots. So we, we anchored above it. But um, that's how I, I, I changed my assessment based on the athlete. I just start with who's in front of me. Simple, consistent, repeatable. I've got, um, uh, you know, I've had a couple of athletes over the years who are more like 43, 44 um, below the average, but they shoot with consistency. So I don't touch it. If we get down into high 30s, which I, uh, I have seen, um, low 40s, then we address it. But um, otherwise, I won't touch it. Okay, awesome. Seth, um, can you let us know where people can find you on socials uh, if they have more questions for you? Perfect. Right there. <laughs> I want to say thank you. Um, you can find me uh, on Twitter, Instagram, um, at Sefu Bernard. I'm better on Twitter than I am on Instagram in terms of responding. Feel free to, to drop me a note. I'm happy to exchange ideas if I can be a resource and support. Um, but thank you again. I really appreciate the invitation and uh, hopefully some of the ideas have helped. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I, as I was listening to you, I was thinking of the first time that I saw you speak. It was the first year I had started coaching and I was working with young kids like U12. And I just remember thinking like, man, this guy works in the W and like I coach little kids and even I can learn. Like there's something that's here for me. So mm -hmm. It's, it's always great listening to you because no matter what age group you coach, you always give us nuggets. So thank you. And thank you for giving us your time. So close off the season. We really appreciate it. <laughs> My pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you all. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Seth.